What he didn't tell you is that we created a few problems along the way, and uh, we solved a few, I guess. We thought we solved them anyway. <laughs> Then we got out in the ministry. I was already in it. I was so green. I guess you could say I dripped behind the ears. I was just young. I'd only been pastoring a few years. And uh, but then, of course, serving in his church. And well, we were just two young men that uh, had a vision and heart to do something great for God. And I want to be used. And man, I'm just excited about seeing what the Lord is allowing your pastor to be part of here at your church. It's an exciting work. I, I've always been very endearing and had a, had a heart and love for military people that serve our country. I'm so thankful you're here, and that's what you do. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service, and uh, it means the world to me. Uh, I feel like whenever I was, I told a little bit of our story this morning, me and my wife, high school sweethearts, I say that, but I mean, we really didn't start dating to the end of my senior year. Uh, matter of fact, our first date was my graduation, so I don't know if you really can technically say high school sweethearts. She chased me that whole year. I, I eluded and ran as hard as I could. <laughs> And uh, everything, and then I finally said, "Okay, okay, look, lady, if if you if it means that much to you, uh, you know." And I gave in, and we went to the graduation together, and the rest is history, and uh, what have you there. But where I really missed it, I feel like, was that she was. Uh, I, you know, she had three more years of high school, and then she went to college. You know, after the fact, I, I really I look back now, and and I think I really missed it. I, I should have went and served. Uh, my country. I missed, you know, that was a part of my life. If I have a regret, I wish while she was finishing her education uh, that I would have done that. But thank you very much for your service and I uh, appreciate Glad you got somewhere to go to church while you're over here. Amen. And a good solid church. And I, I love the story uh, of this place concerning the fact that your pastor was here and in it whenever he was in the military and God used it mightily in his life, brought him full circle. I'll be honest with you, when we were in Bible college together, I just I, I appreciated his company so much. I was praying that God would just let him be a Virginia redneck forever. And, uh, you know, I could just be a couple hours up the street and I could still enjoy his fellowship. But, you know, uh, the Lord uh, moved his heart and put it in his heart, he and Miss Rune and the family, to come here and serve the Lord here. And what better place? There's no better place in the world they could be serving than here. And, you know, I learned a long time ago that, that what matters most is that we're in God's will. Um, a lot of times in the flesh, me wanting him to stay in Virginia because of our friendship, that's a fleshly desire. And uh, But if he had stayed there, he wouldn't be happy. And I'm going to tell you where we're the most happy at, where we're the most prosperous, is in the middle of the will of God. And uh, on the fringe is no good, on the outskirts is no good, and definitely outside of is no good. And so I challenge you this week, and uh, what we want to do is we want to get in the center of the will of God for our homes and our marriages, and then let God do some great work in that if we're where we need to be, okay? And here's something to think about tonight. This, this whole marriage family conference is six services. If you think about Sunday school, three times a day on Sunday, and then, of course, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. So really, at the end of this service, we're halfway finished. Wow. And so if you put it in perspective, this thing's going to be gone. These kind of meetings fly by. They always do. And, uh, and so I want to challenge you to just, uh, just stay tapped in. Great attendance tonight. Great attendance this morning. And uh, stay tapped in. This thing will be over. And uh, we'll be on a plane back to Never Never Land in just a few days. And uh, so I want to enjoy my time here with the Lord and with you while we can. Book of 2 Samuel chapter number 15. 2 Samuel chapter number 15. Pastor McKittrick, McKittrick asked me, could I have your titles for every night? And at the end of the service, I'll probably give a little teaser, let them know. And I, that totally steals my thunder. I mean, back home, I won't even let my wife know what I'm preaching. My kids will say, what are you preaching today, Dad? I said, I don't know. You have to show up and see, you know? And Because I like to read my, te my text, and then I'm like, you know, building up to that. Give them a title, and hopefully that grabs them. And if it doesn't, they just kind of nod off, you know, and you know, then it'll come back to 30 minutes later or whatever. But in the same, you know, you're getting the title early, so you kind of know where I'm going uh, before I get there. But it's okay. It all comes out the same in the end, all right? 2 Samuel chapter number 15, 2 Samuel chapter 15. I want to read verses 1 through 6 tonight. It will give us the premise for what we're going to be preaching this evening with the help of the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 1, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So let me just quickly bring you up to speed about this Absalom. Absalom was the third son of King David, and he was a, a very uh, nice-looking young man. He's known in the Bible because of his uh, luscious locks, I call them. That. He's had hair that just uh, Fabio-type hair. <laughs> Stuff that, uh, yeah, no, not me, never had that, never will. And uh, I look more like, I don't know, Telly Savalas, I guess you could say, kind of hair for long. And, uh, but just, it was, so, it was so, uh, so beautiful and so thick and rich that he would cut it once a year 
And, and the Bible says it weighed, what he would cut off weighed five pounds. I mean, just, just a head full of hair. Matter of fact, it ended up being the downfall of him. He would die because he got hung. Uh, and how, what a way to go, by the way. He's riding his, his mule up under this tree, and it catches him by his hair, leaves him hanging there, mule rides off. You know, it's kind of an interesting thought if you think about it. And, but anyway, he's, a, he, he's the third, third born son of David the king, and he, he's trying to steal his father's kingdom from him. And the way he is going to accomplish that is found in the text. The Bible says in verse 2, watch this, And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. So you have Absalom here actually out of line. He's standing down by the gate where everyone would come to go see the king uh, or make their petition known, and he would catch them as they'd come by, and he'd say, where are you from? They'd say, oh, well, you know, I'm of such and such tribe. Oh, you're, you're one of the tribes of Israel. Well, then Absalom would kind of from there begin to uh, work on their heart. What's what happens in verse 3? And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. In other words, the king can't, uh, doesn't have time for you today. He said, well, but I've got time, is what Absalom was saying. And it uh, goes on to say in verse 4, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, talking about the king, he put, or talking about Absalom, excuse me, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner, in other words, by these ways, did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. And here's the key phrase. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So what you have in the story this evening is you've got the men of Israel would be trying to pay homage to and go before the king who is David here. And Absalom, because he wanted David's kingdom, he eventually would try to steal that from him steps into a spot where he made himself visible in their lives. And as they would come by, he would give them attention. And he would give them affection. And in doing so, he stole their heart, which allowed him to purport an insurrection in the kingdom. And I want to use that thought this evening, and, and, and I'm going to use something bad that Absalom did and turn it into something good that we can do and preach with the help of the Lord. Get ready for it. It's not like you don't know it, right? <laughs> Capturing the heart of your spouse. Amen. If Absalom can steal the hearts of the men of Israel, and then that means the heart is stillable, if that's even a word. Okay. Remember, I apologize twice already for my southern roots. Okay. But if Absalom can steal their heart, then you know what you and I should do? This should be our desire to steal the heart of our spouse. I want my wife's heart. I don't want somebody else to have it. I don't want it just to be floating around out there for somebody like this to grab. I want to be the one that has it. And so for a few minutes this evening, capturing the heart of your spouse. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity of prayer, Lord, to be back this evening in the house of God. I want to thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of these fine people. Lord, as they have came back tonight, Lord, after getting what we received this morning from your word, and they're hungry, God, this evening to, dear Lord, hear from you. And I pray that you would give us wisdom and dear lord empower us with the spirit of god to be to break the bread of life and lord feed god the hungry hearts of these folks i ask you god to meet with us to challenge us to change us and above all things let christ be glorified through our marriages as they're strengthened by your word have your way in these things we'll give you the glory in jesus name we ask and pray amen and amen well this evening as we got back for service time i did not get here in time to ask pastor mckittrick what time I should be done, so that means, therefore, since I don't know, I'm ignorant, and therefore, I can preach till midnight. I'm just picking. I don't have that in me. I'm still coming out of the fog of an afternoon Sunday nap here on the other side of the world. My body thinks it's like 5 o'clock in the morning, which it is back home. I'm getting ready to get up and go preach there, but I'm really not going to be there today. So when we get done in a few minutes, I'm finished for the day. I'll feel like I had Sunday off. It'll be a blessing. Amen. <laughs> And we come tonight to 2 Samuel chapter number 15, and we're finding out about a man by the name of Absalom. As I've already mentioned several things about him being the son of David the king, we find he's somewhat up to nothing but mischief tonight. He is 
literally standing down by the gate of the city. The gate would be the most important place in the town pretty much besides getting in the throne or, or before the throne of the king. It would be a place of activity. It would be a place where men would come in and out. It would be kind of like wherever uh, you would identify in your life as the place to be. It would be where all things would take place at. They had judgment there where they, if they had issue, they would come there uh, and then they would try to get an audience with the king. And we, excuse me, find Absalom here tonight and he is in the process of uh, being up to no good. His desire is to steal the hearts of the men of Israel to have their affections bent toward him because his ultimate plan is he wants to overthrow his father's throne. He wants to take the throne from his daddy. And so this is the way that he sets out about to do that. So I think tonight you and I could say that Absalom knew that if he could have the hearts of those men, he could accomplish almost anything. And I want to say tonight that if you have the heart of your spouse and, and, your, sp and your, your spouse has your heart, then I believe your marriage is almost fail-proof. I believe you can accomplish anything as far as longevity. My brother Blue was mentioning his parents there, and I believe getting ready to celebrate 55 years pretty, pretty soon. That, my friend, in the day we're living in is almost an unheard of achievement. Right. That deserves no doubt a trip to anywhere in the world you want to go. That deserves a, a, probably a brand new Lexus and a lot of other things just for sticking it out. That deserves a hunting trip somewhere, uh, as our fine friends from Mississippi was telling us after the service how wrong I was about my uh, ideas on venison. I had just not had it right. It's not been cooked right, and I totally agree, and I'm sure when they get back to the States, they're going to make sure that I get some of their, their venison and uh, that it's cooked to perfection, no doubt. But Absalom here in the Bible is up to no good. He's going to try to steal the hearts of these men so he can accomplish his goal. And I don't know about you, but I tell you what I want to do. I want to see 55 years of marriage. Yeah. If the Lord allows me to live, and we, uh, we just uh, had a president lose, or an ex-president lose his, his wife, Miss Barbara Bush, just passed away. And if I remember correctly, I believe they celebrated 73 years of marriage. That is longer than most people will live. But what a crowning achievement. You better believe this, inside of that marriage, they didn't have 73 years of bliss with no uh, misunderstandings. They didn't have 73 years of, of perfection where neither one of them were upset or discouraged or distraught or felt like one or the other had been let down. What it was, was it was a process of growing, it was a process of making mistakes and correcting them. And I want to say this tonight, friend, I guarantee you one thing for 73 years, they at least had each other's hearts. That's the only way you're going to make it through those ups and downs and those growing pains in life and marriage. And so tonight, let's you and I uh, dive into God's Word and find out what it will take or what Absalom did to capture the heart of his spouse. Now, before we get to the text and begin to break it down, I wanted to lay some groundwork this evening, if I could, and just study the heart for a little bit. The Bible has a lot to say about the heart, and if we understand what the Bible says about the heart, we'll understand what it's going to take to capture, amen, the heart of our spouse. So I'm going to ask you tonight to mark your place there in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 15. And if you could, let's go over to the book of Proverbs for a few minutes. And I want to show you several verses in Proverbs that will give you some understanding about the heart and show you what it's going to take how, uh, to, to capture that, the, uh, the way the heart responds. Our heart actually responds differently to different kinds of things. So go to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 3, and we'll see what, what, what it takes to make it possible uh, to be able to capture the heart of the individual. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 3 this evening, by way of introduction, the Bible says this, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck. Watch this next phrase. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So in other words, here in this verse, the heart is compared to a tablet, meaning that it can be written on. That means the heart is impressionable. That means things that we do, things that we say to each other, decisions that we make, and whether we're taking into account uh, how that decision is going to affect our spouse or whether or not we even care, that is an impressionable thing on the heart. The heart is, is impressionable. It can be written upon. And so I'll be honest with you, we need to realize this about our heart and about the heart of our spouse. Whatever it's exposed to affects it. If you're exposing the heart of your spouse to harshness, it affects it. Just the same if you're exposing the heart of your spouse to care and kindness and compassion, it affects it. And so right now, we are building a resume on the heart of our spouse. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's a lot easier to capture. We, in our text back in 2 Samuel, we don't find Absalom capturing the heart of people that he has issue with, contention. We have him capturing the heart of people that he has showed kindness to, interest in, things of that nature. So the reason that's possible is because the heart 
it, like a tablet can be written upon. Go to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 8, and we'll look, we'll look uh, uh, about some more things about the heart. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 8. As you're turning over to Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 8, we, we probably tonight, before we leave our last point, should ask ourselves the question of what have I written on the table of the heart of my mate? What's on the table there? Is, it, is, it a, is their heart broken or is their heart happy? What is the state of the heart of my mate because of what I've been writing there? In Proverbs 10 verse 8, the Bible says, The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a pratting fool, Proverbs 10 8, shall fall. We need to realize this evening that the heart is susceptible to change. You know, a lot of times in a marriage, we'll say, boy, I sure wish this would change in our marriage. But I'm going to say this, for whatever that is to change, the heart's got to change. But to give you hope this evening that it's worth capturing the heart of your spouse, the heart is changeable. A heart that will receive commandments. Now, if you're stubborn and nobody can tell you anything, you're not going to change. Right. Yeah, if you're hard-headed as a mule, as they would say back where I'm from, there is no hope for you until that changes. You've got to be willing, first of all, to say, you know what, I need to soften this heart up and listen to what others have to say to me because nobody's got it all figured out except me. That's what we all think, right? You know, yeah, you're right. I mean, nobody's got it figured out except me. <laughs> you know, right? And, but in reality, none of us really have it all figured out. And so we, we can take solace in the fact tonight that if someone's willing to receive commandments, they can get wise in their heart. And so make sure this evening that whenever it comes to capturing the heart of your spouse, have some hope in your heart that their heart can change. Number three, if you would go over to Proverbs 12 and verse number 25, this is something about the heart that's very important as well. The Bible says this in Proverbs 12, 25, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. I don't know about you, I do not want to be the perpetual reason why my, the heart of my spouse is heavy. Because of the things I say to her, because of the way I treat her, because of uh, the things that I do that I know breaks her heart. I don't want to cause heaviness. And the best way or the best thing to do if you are being the instrument of the heaviness of your spouse's heart is to come around with a good word because the Bible says a good word maketh it glad. And that doesn't mean you can mess up and always apologize and it's all gonna, always going to work out. You know, the answer is not to be a jerk and then bring flowers. That might work a few times, but ultimately it's going to be like, okay, enough of the flowers. Quit being a jerk. <laughs> All right? And so, but heaviness in the heart, the Bible teaches us, make it, it makes it to stoop, okay? Look in Proverbs 14, 14, a few more verses and we'll be done. We'll get back in our text tonight. The Bible says this, the backslider in the heart shall be filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Uh, tonight, the Bible makes a prescription here that if you're a, if, if you're operating in your own ways and your ways are not God's ways, and the Bible teaches us very clearly that our ways are not His ways, then we're a backslider. Let me just give you this, because if you're going to get any, any help at all in, in capturing the heart of your spouse or having a heart that is capturable, there we go with another one of those words I have to look up later, see if it's in the dictionary. If that's going to happen, then you've got to get to the place where what you think is okay is not okay. We need to realize something as, as Christians. If we're going to wear that name and profess to be that, whenever you become a Christian, you really got to realize this right off the bat. Because of your Adamic fallen nature, you don't have a clue how to run your life. Oh, but I think, well, it don't matter what you think. It don't matter what I think. You know, I, there's, there's some things that I think about being a husband and a father and even a pastor. That, well, that's a good idea. And then I find something in the Bible that totally contradicts what I think. And you know what I've learned about God? You know, we have a weird way of looking at our relationship with the Lord in this day and hour. People think that God's like totally impressed with any effort they make to do anything for him. Well, I went to church one time last year. Well, God's really tickled about that. You know, in reality, no, not really. I fell way below the mark or the line of what God expects of us. But if I, if I, if I always operate in my ways, if I, because in reality what that is, is you being your own God. If I think that, if I don't consort this book and find out what God wants for me and I make my own decisions and then I say, well, this is what I believe and God's going to be okay with that. Well, don't you think you should ask him? Right? right. If you want to find out if God's going to be happy with the decisions you're making in your life, just ask him. Go and see what he's already said and let's find out if he's going to be happy or not. Right? I don't have to guess. I mean, if I mistreat my wife in any way, shape, or form and think, well, you know, I, I deserve to talk to her like that for that time. You know, well, hang on a second. What did God say about it? God said, love her like Christ loved the church. 
So, so if I mistreated her, I can justify it all I want to in my mind, but that doesn't mean that God's okay with it, right? right? Amen. And what we have to realize is if I, if, I, if I have any other way of looking at it, I'm a backslider because I'm filled with my own ways, so my heart's backslidden. I want to say this, you can't capture a backslider's heart. One thing we all have to come to the table tonight and ask ourselves this, if my spouse decides in this message that they want to capture my heart, is it capturable? The only way it's going to be capturable is I'm, capturable is I'm going to be in fellowship with God. Oh, we talked about this morning. And desire to be in fellowship with my spouse. And then on top of that, have a heart that's headed in the right direction so that my spouse... Because see, here's the thing about it. When we get married, I, I tell folks this all the time. When you come down the aisle to get married, what you've got is two sinners coming to an altar. Saved or not. Still sinners. You know what sinners do? We sin. We still sin. How do we get saved? Right? And often as married people, we sin against each other. It doesn't have to be in the form of, you know, something like adultery. It can just be disrespect. It can just be selfishness. And I, I tell people this, when you come down to get married, you actually both come down with suitcases. And I ain't talking about what's packed up in the car waiting to go on the honeymoon. I'm talking about baggage. You come to the altar with preconceived ideas about what marriage is supposed to be like, about what life's supposed to be like, about... And in reality, we come down and we say, you know what, this is going to be great because this person offers something that I feel like I'm missing, and as long as they do what I want them to do, this thing's going to work out good. And you get married and realize they come to the altar with the same preconceived idea. They were missing something. They're looking for you to meet their need. And then that's whenever that battle of the wheels starts between two people, and there's a tug of war. I'm trying to change you, and you're trying to change me, and we'll talk about this later in the week. That is so far away from what biblical marriage looks like. Biblical marriage is not the tug of war about me trying to pressure you and get you to do what I want and vice versa, but it's actually taking on the attitude that, what do you need? What makes you click? Because whatever makes you click is what I was put in this relationship to fulfill. And so this evening what we realize is that the heart is, is able to be backslidden until you and I take the avenue of believing and realizing that we'll never get serious enough with God to say, you know what? Enough of me running my life. Enough of me thinking I know what needs to do, be done in this marriage. It's time to get to the instruction manual and find out what God says so that therefore we have instructions on which way to go. Look in Proverbs 15, 13. Two more verses by way of introduction. We'll hop in the text. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 13, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Now let me ask you this question tonight. If I were to ask you this, what is the state of your mate's heart based on that verse? Is it a merry heart because they truly experience happiness or is it a broken heart and why? Wouldn't it be, how are you going to ca capture the heart of your spouse if you're the instrument that is making their heart broken? See, in this thing of life, if we're not careful, and this is why some folks have a lot of issues in their marriage later in life because they sin against each other so much in the early days that so much bitterness and hurt and brokenness is there, it's sometimes hard to get past that. And it can literally cut the legs out from your, under yourselves in your marriage because that's why, I mean, you know, this church seemingly has a lot of young couples in it, young families, and, and like Pastor said this morning, Get it on the right track now. Learn some things now that will keep you from having to get over a whole bunch of transgression between each other years down the road. Let me give you one more verse in Proverbs 28, 14. We're learning about the heart before we go back and figure out how to capture it. In Proverbs 28, 14, the Bible says this, Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. In other words, the heart that you're trying to capture, it can be hardened. What does a hardened heart look like? A hardened heart looks like this. A hardened heart gets to the place, it doesn't care how much you change. It doesn't care what you do, I'm done. It's hard. It's rocky. And so that's why it's important to learn early how, what affects the heart and then try your best to make your mind, I'm going to live a life to capture the heart. I don't want to continually discourage my mate or hurt my mate to the place that their heart hardens. I, I've literally said in counseling sessions with people before to where one of them seemingly wanted so hard to make the marriage work and make it right, and the other person sat there completely unaffected. 
thought in the beginning, I'm so sad that one wants it so bad and one doesn't, but the more you dig and the more you ask and the more you talk, you find out that this person has been so transgressed against that now their heart is hardened and they may choose to finish the rest of their life living with that individual for either the sake of their children and or the sake of their vows and commitments to God, but you can forget having happiness because that heart is already so hard. And so tonight, let's you and I go back to 2 Samuel and we're going to see what Absalom did to capture the hearts of those men. And tonight, we're going to use that as a catalyst to try to understand it so that we can hopefully accomplish capturing or stilling the heart of our own spouse tonight. Now, let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 1, and we're going to figure out how to steal the heart of our spouse. Anytime y'all want to turn the air on tonight, I'm fine with it. You want to... <laughs> hey Amen. I feel like a french fry up in our lamp up here tonight. And uh, this evening, it's never night here. I learned that when we got here. It never, never gets dark here, but like five minutes at a time. And uh, after the first day, we woke up. And it's, uh, I'm an early riser. I got up at like 1.15. That, that was not on purpose. Uh, our, our first night here got up, and like the sun came up at 4 o'clock. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I can get used to this. The land of the rising sun, right? Well, it's, it's up here now on my head. It feels like. <laughs> all right, you ready? Number one, first of all, the, how, do you, how do you steal the heart of your spouse? The Bible says in 2 Samuel 15, 1, and it came to pass after this, that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50, man, 50 men excuse me, to run before him. You know what Absalom was doing here? He prepared a fine-looking entourage in which he would arrive at the gate of the kingdom every day. He had 50 men that would run out in front of him. That, that showed strength and power. And then he had horses and chariots. And if you're note-taking tonight, write this down. The first thing you do if you're going to steal the heart of your spouse is you need to work on your appearance. Now, I'm not talking so much about the physical appearance that you have, though that has an important role. I doubt very seriously that your mate was attracted to you because they thought you were the ugliest duckling in the pond. But I'm talking about something much deeper than physical appearance. Physical appearance will change in time. As we get older, things are just going to, they just change. We are, our body is literally designed that we're born dying. We understand that, right, tonight? And so therefore, I'm not so much interested in that. But here's what Absalom was trying to do. He was physically trying to portray excellence. He wanted to look like a king in their eyes. And so appearance does make a difference, all right? Those physical type uh, happy attributes will die. But what I want to really concentrate when it comes to working on our appearance are the spiritual attributes. How am I going to capture the heart of my spouse if they can't see Christ's likeness in me? So we want to look at that tonight because I'm going to be honest with you, friend. If you're going to have a Christian marriage and a Christian family and Christian home, your spouse is going to know whether you are Christ-like and they're not giving their heart to somebody who's not, all right? Uh, you say, preacher, I mean, what's it going to take to have a Christ-like spirit that we're, as far as appearance-wise goes? Well, let me just give you one verse. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that is being talked about there is a mind of humility. Because it's speaking about the fact that he was willing to lay down his deity, well not his deity, lay down his glory and put on flesh and come and dwell with men so that he could walk among them and die for them. And, 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 and in doing so, he was equal with God but thought it robbery not to lower himself in the eyes of others. It's going to take humility for you and I to work on our spirit, work on our appearance before our spouse that will give us the resume to steal or capture their heart. With that being said, this evening I want to take you over to a passage of Scripture that I believe is the litmus test that we want to look at and take this evening concerning our appearance before our mate. If someone is going to look at our Christianity and judge it, they should judge it by the fruit of it. And the Bible teaches you and I in the book of Galatians chapter 5 what the fruits of the Spirit look like. They're tangible. You can look at them. You can identify them. You can measure them. So mark your place there again in Second uh, uh, Samuel chapter 15. Let's go over to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Look at every one of the fruits of the Spirit just real shortly here. Now I'm going to ask you to do something tonight. I'm going to ask you as we go through these one by one, I want you to give yourself a rating, and then I want you to rate your spouse. Where well, you're at, where they're at. And then later if you're brave enough, you can share answers. You don't have to. I'm not interested in having Brother McKittrick have to do marriage counseling this week, but I'm just saying a lot of times you'll find out that where you think you are and where your mate perceives you are apart, far apart. And you're not capturing their heart if, if you think you're a nine in this area and they think you're a two. 
you got to get that somewhere in the middle there to find out so that you can make some changes, all right? Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. When you get there, say amen. Is everyone there? Fantastic, all right. Don't let that word scare you. That just means let it be so. That means you agree with what I'm saying, okay? Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, number one, love. Now remember, I'm going, you're rating yourself right here, and then your mate's going to rate you, uh, and then you, maybe you can talk about it later. But before you rate yourself, let's talk about this love. The Bible, when it talks about love, there are different levels of love. There is a phileo love, a friendship type love. There is then an agape love, which means a God type love. The agape love will look over one's faults. And agape love is unconditional. It, it's, it's 1 Corinthians 13 love. That's agape love. And the word that is used here in this text is agape. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is agape love. Do you remember whenever uh, the Lord Jesus was having the conversation with Peter in John 21, and he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. They were using different words. The Lord wanted to know, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter said, oh, yeah, Lord, I phileo you. I have a friendly endearment towards you. Yeah, you do. Most likely in your marriage you have that, but I challenge you, if you were to uh, hold your love up under the light of 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about being patient, long-suffering. Love is kind. Agape love is kind. It's not, it's not abrasive and harsh and mean and these things. It doesn't, it's not vindictive. It's forgiving. And if you were this evening, if you were to say to yourself, what kind of love do I show to my... What, I'm talking about working on my appearance. What if my, right, right now, when I, as I'm rating myself, what are they writing on that paper about my love? Right? What would you be a 5, a 7, a 9? What would, would you be a 10? No, most likely not, if you're honest. But in the same... One of the best ways to figure that out is this right here. When it comes to your love, are you putting your spouse at the top of your priority list? Do they rank above your friends, your family, your career, your hobbies, your ambitions? Or would your spouse tonight say, you know, if it comes down between me and, you know, a hobby, I'm probably taking a back seat. Or if it really got hot in the family over me and the in-laws, then I know that they're going to side with the in-laws. That's not a biblical number 10 love. That's not an appearance you want to give to your mate if you're going to try to capture their heart. That'll have to change before that heart ever opens up and says, yes, you can have me, all right? Number two, there in Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then it, then it says joy. That is just talking about a cheerfulness. You know, no one wants to enjoy or, or no, one, no one wants to be married to Oscar the Grouch. And if you're in a perpetual bad mood and been that way since you were born, it's probably time to snap out of it, all right? It, 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 no one wants to come home to that, wake up to it, or live with it, all right? And you say, well, I just can't help it. It's the way I'm nature. Well, unnature yourself then. <laughs> Get up every morning, look in the mirror, and say, whether you like it or not, you're going to smile today. You are a you rough to live with, all right? And work on it and change it. it there's something on the inside that's going to have to happen probably first, but it, it's changeable. Number three, you see this. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and then peace. You know, peace is the opposite of being contentious. Always looking for a fight. If you were to rank yourself and if your mate was to rank you, are you the kind of person that every time they turn around, there's, there's something being stirred in the pot, as they say. Always something going on that, that you're stirring the pot. Are you a peaceful person? I don't know about you, but if you're going to capture the heart of your spouse, you're going to have to have a peaceful disposition. Number four, long-suffering. In other words, that's talking about having fortitude in your expectations. Wherever you're at right now is not where you'll be in 10, 10 years. The question is, are you giving time for growth and maturity, right? I don't know about you, but, but I've been saved now for almost 19 years, and I'm still not there. I'm still being worked on. i got a long way to go. And I'm glad that God is patient with me. And the same kind of patience that God has with me, my wife should receive from me. Isn't it amazing how that, boy, we want God to be long-suffering and graceful and, you know, Lord, I'm not perfect and we're, we're all humble about, you know, you know, admitting that even if some of the time it's false humility, it's still humility regardless. But, boy, our spouse, let them mess up. And we're like, I can't believe you did that. You sinned against me. And I'm going to be mad about it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But, boy, whenever we come down the altar, we won't go. And they'll say, I'm sorry. And you'll be like, yeah, I forgive you. Yeah. And then... The body language says something totally different, you know. I forgive you, you know. And, you know, what if we come down on Sunday morning and got right with God and come back the next day and it felt like we were like a stranger? You don't feel like that. Whenever we do what 1 John 1, 9 says, confessing our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us, we don't have to come back in sheepishly the next day and wonder, did, did he really forgive me? Can I really have communion? Oh, no, we know that now that we've gotten right with God, we can come on in and have communion with the Lord. 
It ain't always like that with each other sometimes. And I'm going to be honest with you, if we don't have a long-suffering disposition, we can forget capturing. They're going to, that, that appearance, you know, that appearance, they're going to be like, I'm not going to give you my heart. I can't trust you. Because every time I mess up, it takes you six months to get over it. Am I doing some good preaching or not? I'm telling you right now, you ain't got to say amen, but I just say it for myself, all right? And ain't nothing wrong with that. Jesus ain't man his own preaching sometimes. He would say to them, amen. Well, if you disciples are going to stand there and look at me like you didn't get it, I'll get it for you. Amen. All right? Just picking. Galatians 5.22, watch this now. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long gentleness. No one's giving you their heart if you're rough with them. Now, and when, when we say that, we naturally think of the man's role. But I'm going to be honest with you, boy, you, there are some women out there who are pistols. Right? I mean, some of y'all are going to be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I ain't, ain't going to look back at you right now. I ain't going to make eye contact because I don't want nobody, I don't want to give away your position here tonight. Okay? <laughs> Woo! Having a good time over here in Japan tonight. But I'm talking about gentleness. You're, who's going to give you their heart if you're a bull in a china shop all the time? If I want to give my heart to someone, it's going to be someone with an appearance that I can trust you when I need you to be gentle with me. Right? Say, so, you know, well, gentle, I don't really need anybody to be gentle with me. I promise you there'll be some times in life when you do. When we do make mistakes, or when you are going through a hard time in life, it doesn't matter how tough or how strong you are, how well or how, how, how firm your disposition is, there's going to be a time or two in life whenever life cuts your legs out from under you. And what you're going to need is care and compassion, not someone who's cold and calloused and don't care. So if you're working on your appearance whenever your mate looks at you, and you may be strong in, in, in your personality, there's nothing wrong with that, but do they know that with a flipping of a switch, you can be as gentle as a loving mother. That matters. Amen. You're going to have to work on that appearance if you're going to capture the heart of your spouse. Look here, in, in the latter part of that same verse, he talks about this thing called goodness. May I say tonight, this thing called goodness as a fruit of the Spirit, I believe it speaks uh, to the intent of the heart and one's trustworthiness. Over in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, we read about the, the virtuous woman. She's, uh, we don't know if she existed. We think she did, but man, she's like superwoman with a cape. You know, like Miss Perfect does everything right. But one of the things the Bible brings out about her is in Proverbs 31, 12, and the Word of God says this, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. He, he trusted her because she was a woman of goodness. He, he wasn't worried about her embarrassing him. He wasn't worried about her being unfaithful to him. And, and that works on both sides of the fence, by the way. And so uh, if you're going to work on your appearance, there's going to be a true spirit and nature of goodness your spouse is going to have to know that it matters to you if they're happy. And you're willing to go out of your way to do things to see that accomplished in their life. The next thing it talks about there in the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm almost finished with this part of the message, is faith. In other words, when you're talking about your appearance, your spouse knows what you really are spiritually. Now listen to me, Missy. I'm preaching this week a marriage conference, a family conference. And when you get that in line with God's Word, there's a structure to it. And on Tuesday night, we'll have split sessions where I'll be speaking specifically to the men and my wife will be speaking to the ladies. And fellas, all I can say, you better wear that night two pair of underwear. Because <laughs> we're not pulling any punches. If you're soft, bring two boxes of tissue because you're going to need them. Because we're going to be talking about God's prototype of a man. And you know what God believe, or God expects of the man? He expects him to lead his family spiritually. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the role he's supposed to play. He's supposed to be leading. He should be, it, it doesn't, it's not about whether or not his wife prays all the time. He should be a man of prayer. Right. Whenever, whenever life gets sketchy, the man, the husband, should be able to lay his Bible open and say, all right, here's exactly what God's Word says, and this is the way we need to go. Good. Now, I'm a pastor to a small congregation there in Seagrove, North Carolina, and my phone is always open, as is my home, and you can call me anytime, but I'm going to tell you this, I got, when I got saved, we were, we, were, we were engaged at the time, or as a matter of fact, I got saved, we got, we got engaged very shortly thereafter, and then got married, but I'll be honest with you, I was not wanting my wife as a young married man, every time she had a Bible question, I had to go to the pastor. So I stuck my nose in that book because I wanted to lead my family, and I want her to know, you got a spiritual question, you just come ask me, baby. <laughs> I'm going to be Superman. I'm going to be the hero, right? You need some money? Come ask me. You know? You got a Bible question? Come ask me. 
because I didn't want some other guy being the one that fulfilled a role in her life that was my privilege and responsibility. Amen. Now, I'm not picking on anybody. You may not have been saved very long at all. I'm not saying that, you know, you should struggle and not be able to get your answers instead of go to your pastor. That's what he's here for. But I'm going to say this, guys. It doesn't take nothing but a dedicated life of spending a few minutes a day in God's Word, and God will start to saturate your heart with that. But I'm going to be honest with you. And this is something else that wasn't happening whenever I, I married a good-looking woman. Woo, I felt something on that. She's still good-looking. I tell her every day. You say, really, you know, absolutely I do. If some guy ever comes by and drops a, a compliment in my wife's ear, it won't be the first time she's heard it. Yeah. Right, man, she hears it from me all the time. <laughs> Listen to me now. And I did not want, and I would not allow, my wife isn't going to church without me. <laughs> Ain't no way. You know why? Because there might be somebody else that coming out to hers. And if my wife's sitting in church without me, and she says, I sure wish that we could have a family that loved God together, I want to capture her heart. So I'm going to give her the appearance, hey, baby, I ain't perfect, but I'm working on being the man that God wants me to be and you want me to be. Yeah. Right? Amen. And so I'm getting up tomorrow morning before you do, and I'm going to get in my Bible. And I'm going to, at our house, we have kind of a, it's a running joke. You know, they say, you, you know, what kind of family you got. You can tell who loves who by who makes the coffee. Well, we make each other. She makes mine every night before she goes to bed. And then I beat her up, me drink the pot, and then I make it for her before she gets up. <laughs> I ain't got a problem with that. <laughs> but if I'm going to lead my family, that means tomorrow morning, regardless of what part of the world I'm in, I'll be up before everybody else is, digging in this book, spending time with God in prayer, because she deserves that kind of man. And you know what that says to her? I can trust him. He's not playing around with life. I didn't marry a little boy. I married a man. Amen. And Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I, I'm just going to go ahead and preach a little bit. I spake as a child, but when I become a man, I put away childish things. That's right. And I'm going to tell you the problem with marriages in our culture today is there's too many folks walk down the aisle when they were still kids, and 20 years later, they're still kids. Right. And, you know, get, get that paycheck, and really, you know, we got bills to pay. Well, I'm going to send me a new game for my Xbox. <laughs> Yeah, well, we got kids in groceries, so you can take your Xbox down to the pawn shop and sell it, right? And then you get in a conversation like this, and you're like, I want to win the heart of my, my spouse. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you have to be a man first. You have to pull your man card out and go get it changed from a permit to an actual license. Yeah. Get an endorsement on that thing, and the only way you get an endorsement on that thing is to have a resume that she respects, a man of faith, moral conviction. Here, I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit. You're working on your appearance, all right? And then there in Galatians 5, 23, he gives a few more and we'll be done. He, said, he talks about meekness. That's humility. I want to say this. When it comes to me working on my appearance as being part of how I'm going to capture the heart of my wife, I should be humble enough that if she says, and she has in our marriage on multiple occasions, Michael, I think this is something that needs some work. I think this, there's an issue here. She should be able to do that and me handle it without raising my voice, without getting angry and defensive. I should be humble enough. If I want to have a great marriage, I should be able to look at her and say, what needs work, baby? And her be able to say, without wondering about, is there going to be repercussions? Well, I'd kind of like for this to change. I'll preach on this tomorrow night about how that men and women are different by design. And I don't know about you guys, but that's hard sometimes to understand, first of all, and then to operate. You know, it's weird because we guys, we can, to us spending time together, we don't even got to talk. You know, we can go do what we can go do, like we can go do something, we can go have a project going on, we can work side by side for eight hours and say ten words, and we're like, man, we, had it. we bonded. <laughs> it was cool. Matter of fact, if you talk too much, get away from me. I want to be over here by myself where it's quiet. You know, just give me a job to do and leave me alone, right? I mean, I'm natured that way. But when women ain't like it, we want to talk and talk <laughs> and talk and talk. And it ain't good enough that you're just in the room or that you say you're listening. Oh, no. I want you to look at me while I'm talking. Never mind, I've gotten in trouble many times. You know, she, we'd be in my office and we'd be talking, you know, and I'll, you know, and I'll look up and I'll be doing this. And, you know, I'll make, I just try to make eye contact every 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that. And she's like, you're not listening to me. And then, and then this really gets me in trouble. I'll give her back every word she said verbatim. I'm listening. Oh, no, you're not. And then I learned over time that means put everything down. And sit down. 
okay, you talk. And then sometimes I'll start to float. And she'll be, you're, you're looking at me, but you're not listening. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to my special place. There's a place I go where nobody else is welcome. You know where it's at, guys. You know, it's out there in La La Land. And all the ladies are going, yeah, he goes there sometimes. And he don't come back for a long time. And it's down over by the fish tank. And we're just standing over there with our hands in our pocket. You know what I'm saying? And just thinking. But it's where we go. But we're nature differently like that. And because of that, this evening, what's going to have to happen in our lives is there's going to have to be enough meekness and whenever your wife says, you know what, I really need better conversation from you. That she knows she can say that without you saying, well, I'm busy. And ain't it good enough that I bring home, you know, the rent money? Mm, nah, that's not going to help our marriage. That's not the appearance that you need to give off that someone is going to give you or allow you to capture their heart. But here's the last one, and I'm finished. He talks about temperance. We know what temperance means. It just means self-control. One of the fruits of the Spirit is temperance, meaning self-control. And here's what you got to ask yourself. Would you give your heart to someone who was a time bomb waiting to explode? Oh, no, nah, you're not going to do that. And that can be male or female. I have pastored and counseled families where sometimes it's the man who has a hard time controlling his temper, and sometimes it's the female. But nonetheless... If you're going to give your heart to someone, Absalom back in 2 Samuel is working on an appearance. He's got the men out in front of him, got the chariots. And so he's the kind of guy that if you were walking by the gate that day and you looked at him and saw him, you'd say, that's a sharp-looking fella. He got his stuff together. He looks like a leader. And then all of a sudden there's a conversation that sparks up. And next thing you know, before long, you're like, I'm going down by the gate just to see Absalom. That guy, he makes me feel good. I like him. And so tonight, if you're gonna if you're gonna capture the heart of your spouse, point number one, you're gonna have to work on your appearance. That's what exactly is going on in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Your spouse, if they just went through that list, should be able to have some pretty high numbers ranking beside of those fruits. And if they don't, when you find out about them later, if you are brave enough to ask, you should say, Oh, okay, I need work here, I need work here. No problem, I got that. I'm gonna start working on it right now. Okay, number two. Go back to 2, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15, and we'll we'll finish up this evening. 2 Samuel 15, and uh, look back in verse number 2. So the first thing that must happen if you're going to uh, capture the heart of your spouse is you need to work on your appearance. Number two, you're going to need to gauge your activity. Watch what happens in, in, in 2 Samuel 15, 2. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. So here's the question tonight. I'm talking about capturing the heart of your spouse. You need to gauge your activity. How involved are you in what's important in their life? Absalom here, and we're going to learn several things about Absalom in this verse that showed you that his activity said, I want your heart. The first thing we find there in verse number 2 is that he was a man of sacrifice. The Bible says he rose up early. In other words, capturing the heart of those men meant so much to him he was willing to forsake sleep he was willing to do without rest to get there at the gate in time to be able to help. I guess you could say in some ways he inconvenienced himself. And they no doubt, and nobody beat him to the gate. You didn't get there that morning and say, well, I wonder if Absalom's going to be here in the next 20 minutes. Oh, no, he was already there. He's waiting. And there's no doubt you'll give your heart to somebody that you mean so much to them that they'll sacrifice their selves and their life for you. Right. That means something to us. As in, And I'm going to say this, if you're going to capture the heart of your spouse, you're going to have to be willing to go out of your way a little bit to win their heart. If in your marriage it's always about you, if you don't get your way, everything stops, slows down, comes to a halt. You know, we've got to go eat where you want to eat. We've got to go on vacation where you want to go on vacation. And the TV's always yours, right? And everything's fine as long as you're happy. If that's the way, it's, if that's the way it is in your home, you're not capturing anybody's, anybody's heart. They need to know that, you know what, sometimes... It's, it's all about me. It's not about you. Sometimes maybe all the guys are going on a golf outing this afternoon and, and they've been playing it for weeks and, and you instead chose to get a sitter and you and I are going to go out and have a meal together. Sacrifice. More, would you have loved to win out with the guys? Went, oh, absolutely. I'd love to go out and hit the white ball. But instead, instead, I decided to sacrifice for you. Number two, not only was there sacrifice involved engaging his activity, there was sincerity. The Bible says this, and Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. They, the gate there in those times was a place where major decisions were being made. 
And what Absalom is showing here is the sincerity of, the, of his heart in the fact that he wanted to be involved in this aspect of their life. And I'll be honest with you, because what was going on with them meant something to him, he meant something to them. In other words, people know whether or not you're sincere in, in how you feel about them and whether or not uh, you, you want to be part of their, or what's going on is important in their life. Let me say it that way instead. And I'll be honest with you, you cannot be disconnected from your mate, just be a roommate who doesn't care about what's important to your spouse and expect to win their heart. Tonight, if we were to ask each other, uh, are, am I the kind of individual that you feel like has your best interest at heart? Sincerely, would you, what, what answer would you get from your spouse tonight? How important this evening is it to you what's important to them? To my wife, um, it, it meant a whole lot. Being a mother is very important to her. We have five children, as I said this morning, and, and right now she has uh, made the choice to forsake career and just spend her time raising those children. And uh, so that means a lot to her at this point of her life. And I, I'm not that, here nor there, okay? But I remember having a conversation with her her junior year of college. And uh, her mother, before I met her father had passed, and so before we got married, I went to her mother and I asked her mother, can I have your daughter's hand in marriage? And she said, yeah, but I want her to finish school. I want her to stay in college. And I said, well, I'll work and take care of all the bills. And she said, well, I'll take care of the school bill. I've got that. I said, okay, that's a deal. We, we can do this. Her junior year of college, she comes to me and says, I've decided that I, I want to be a mother instead of finishing out. And, you know, I mean, I was torn because I'd given her mother my word that I would work, and I was, and I still am. <laughs> All right, I'm still holding up my part of the deal, but I couldn't make a grown woman go do something she didn't want to do. Her, 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 her desires changed. Now, what that meant for me was this right here. Okay, now we're going to be a one-income family. And so that 40 hours wasn't going to cut it anymore. It turned into 50 and 55 and 60 and 65. And I mean, I was burning the candle at both ends, but you know what? Motherhood meant that much to her, and so I want to let her know that what means something to you means something to me. I'll do my part. I'm willing to give up stuff so that you can have your dreams and desires in life. And you know what that has happened? You know what had the return on that's been? She's been willing to give up some of her life so that I can chase my dreams. Uh, she told me, well, we, we picked about it years ago whenever I started to travel a little bit and preach. And she said to me, well, as long as the kids are probably still small, I'm, I'm not leaving them. And... Uh, about two years ago, we started having the chance to do some international travel. And the individual that asked us to go asked us to do a marriage conference in another part of the world. And so he said, would your wife be willing to go? I know she speaks some. Would she go and help us? I said, I'll ask. And if she'd have said no, I'd have been fine with that. But I asked, and she said, yeah, I'll go. So by me being willing to sacrifice and give up for what meant something to her later on in life, she's willing to leave the kid a little early or kids a little early and go some, do something that means something to both of us, which is serve the Lord. But I'll be honest with you, I don't travel a bunch. When I do travel, I like to travel her. It's her or Ron Cole. Y'all know Ron Cole? I'd rather travel her any day of the week. Ron's big and smelly. All right? And I say that on here because I know he'll watch this video and get this, all right? And I love him, okay? So we see here, I'm talking about gauging your activity. If your spouse looks at you and says, okay, do you ever sacrifice for me? Are you sincerely concerned about what makes me happy? And then in verse 2, we also find this concerning our activity. We find in, in this man Absalom, selflessness is what I call it. The Bible says, and Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, any man, notice that, that had a controversy, came to the king for judgment. Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. Now notice this. I'm talking about selflessness here. This man having a problem, it wasn't Absalom's problem. That man had a controversy, and Absalom made it his problem because he wanted to have his heart. So in other words, if your spouse is struggling with something tonight, maybe they have a desire that you, really isn't your desire, are you willing to make it your desire? Are you willing to say, you know what, I, what, what you're wanting to do doesn't mean anything to me, really, but I tell you what I'll do, if it means something to you, it now does mean something to me. Amen. That means a lot to someone whenever, I don't know about you, but inside of a family unit, it's not going to be very strong if it's all give, 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 and there's no take. 
That lasts for a little while, and then eventually someone gets wore out. That's, a, in my opinion, I've called it this uh, before. In, in marriage, that's a form of bondage. That's all that is, is if it's all about one person gets their way and gets pleased and the other person lives their life in bondage and, and, and somewhat enslaved to that individual and, and your happiness is only there whenever they're happy, that's not a marriage. There's got to be selflessness there, and I'll say more about that in days to come, but if you're going to win the heart of your mate this evening, friend, you're going to have to get very involved in what means something to them, all right? There's a book that, I, how many of y'all have ever read or heard of the book, The Five Love Languages? Look, anybody ever read that? Gary Chapman, I believe, wrote it. There's five love languages that he uh, identifies there. And, you know, there's like, a, there's acts of service, there's gifts, there's uh, physical touch, there is words of affirmation, and then there's one more. I'm leaving one out. Anybody know what I'm leaving out? Nobody knows. I said gifts. Time. Is it, is it time? Is that one of them? Oh, quality time. That's it right there. Quality time. Man, you guys have read the book. Praise God. Y'all know it. Well, if my wife's love language is, say, acts of service, and I won't never speak it, then what I'm saying to her is, uh, what, what means something to you don't mean anything to me. But whenever her gift or her, her love language is, say, acts of service, maybe, and, her, and we pick about this, uh, I have a very challenging role. Her, her, her love language changes <laughs> by the day. Like, we'll get up in the morning, I'll be like, so what's the love language? <laughs> she says, well, you'll have to work hard and find out. I say, well, it may be supper time before I figure, you know, because I mean, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box, but I'm going to put it in the effort, all right? And, but whenever you find out what it is, okay, her love language and mine aren't the same. A lot of times, hers is words of affirmation. Now, I don't mind to getting a comment every once in a while, but you know, I don't need to be showered with them all day every day, right? But if words of affirmation is what makes her tick, then I'm speaking them because it's important to her, right? It's, it's a selfless act. And I want to say this, friend, and in the same, what I have found is whenever I selflessly serve her, I get selflessly served. You see what I'm saying? And so whenever you have each other's heart, it works that way. Going back to your text there, 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, where we're talking about capturing the heart of your spouse. It starts with working on your appearance. The second thing we've learned is that you should gauge your activity. Look at yourself. Am I sacrificing for my spouse? Am I sincere or sincerely concerned about what means something to them? Am I selfless? And then the next thing we see is in verse 3 of 2 Samuel 15 is that he begins to give his approval. The Bible says, And Absalom said unto him, the man that come by the gate that day, See thy matters are good and right. You know what Absalom let him know? He let him know that day that he thought he had a great case. Can I say this concerning our marriage? If you're going to capture the heart of your spouse, you can't be their biggest critic. Nobody married someone that's perfect, but nobody also wanted to marry someone who reminded them every day of the areas of their life where they're not. You know, we talk about the nag. You know, you don't want to be a nagging wife, and you don't want to be a nagging husband, okay? And here's why the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. When someone attempts to please you, listen to me now, and all it does is backfire, it leads to a lot of discouragement. In other words, our spouses, when we get into this conference and as we get deeper into it and even get out of it, you may find that your spouse starts changing some things. And maybe the effort they put forth isn't completely what you wanted it to be in a certain area, but don't discount the effort. Don't criticize them because, well, you were shooting for here and you only got here. Give them some, some compliment about just trying to get there. That's what, that's what Absalom said. The cases that were being brought there, they didn't affect his life any. They probably were menial in some regards. But he's not like, man, you need to get over that. That's, that's, that's child's play. He said, oh, your case is good and right. It needs to be heard by the king. And I'm going to tell you what goes a long way inside of a family. I'm talking about when capturing the heart of your spouse. It's for them to get some words of affirmation that, hey, everything's all right. It may not be them doing things, something that they're expected. to. Make. Sometimes, let me say this, sometimes we don't compliment each other enough whenever we're doing that which we feel like it's our duty to do. Like, if you are in a family where, say, just one person works, say it might be the man. We're expected to do that. But it sure is nice every once in a while for your wife to say, I surely appreciate you providing for our family. And you know, there's no law in the Bible that says thou shalt cook. 
I wish there was. But my wife does. And every once in a while, I'll look at her and say, hey, I appreciate the fact that, man, you make sure we eat good. You know, microwave dinners, we don't live on them things. You know, there is a box in the kitchen where this thing goes, you plug it in, and little eyes heat up. It's got a stove. And they still work. It makes a happy husband. <laughs> Home cooking. Amen? amen. Right? You, I know you can't say amen, fellows, but you can, you can think it anyway. In your mind, you can think, <laughs> boy, I wish she, if she wasn't here tonight, I'd say amen. This is the part where I really feel connected to the message, all right? But hey, if, you, if your spouse never hears you say, hey, I appreciate you doing those things. You know, well, he's supposed to work. Oh, she's supposed to cook and clean. Yeah, well, so what? It still helps to hear, hey, thank, thank you for what you're doing. All right, so we find that he's given his approval. And then in verse number four, we also find this. He's given out awards. The Bible says this. Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me. Watch what he says. And I would do him justice. You know what Absalom said? If I was in a position to fix this deal and hear your case and give you an answer, I would. And may I say tonight that for the most part, you and I are in position to reward our mate for making the effort to be that which we need them to be and we desire for them to be. Amen. Amen. If you can tell your spouse is at least making some kind of effort to improve the relationship, the question is this, will you reward them by reaching back? See, because here's what happens. You get in a conference like this, and I mean, it, look, y'all, we're fallible people. I'm talking about all of us, okay? We're fallible people. We got issues, man. And you get in a, a conference like this, and you just go to just breaking down the Bible, and they start floating to the top. <laughs> Them issues do. And this week, if you're honest with yourself and I'm honest with myself, I'm going to find an area that needs some work. And you know what? Before, I, when I find it, your spouse probably already knew it. And here's what's going to matter. Whenever we see them making an effort to make a change, are we going to do our part and say, oh, man, if you're going to work on that, then I need to work on my stuff too. I'm not going to say, well, I sure am glad you was listening last week. <laughs> I've noticed you start picking up them shoes and them socks. I noticed that, big boy. I sure appreciate that, Blue. I hope that that's not what you hear, all right? But here's the problem. In most church marital relationships, listen to me now, there's so much junk, so many years of dysfunctionality and frustration, bitterness, unforgiveness. That's been the marriage so long that it's hard to get where you need to be, but the process has got to start somewhere. And what we should all do this week is sign up and say, I'm going to be the one to get it started. And when that happens, give out some awards. So you know what? I tell you, you ain't got to say this, but you, you can let them know how much you appreciate that they care so much about your marriage. They're willing to work on themselves. Let me give you the last one tonight. We're done. In verse number five, we find this, and this is the last thing that needs to happen if you're going to capture the heart of your spouse. The Bible says, and it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, which means to kind of pay an homage, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. The last thing we find Absalom doing to win the heart or capture the heart of the men of the city was that he gave him affection. I don't know that I understand a marriage that's void of affection. I, we pick about this back where I'm from because, uh, you know, it's a country type setting and the generation before my parents' generation wasn't known for showing affection. They, uh, it's very common to, for my dad's generation to hear them talk that some of those men, uh, many of those men had fathers that never even told them they loved them. They never, I don't understand that. I can't comprehend not telling my children that I love them. I don't know that that's, I think that's just a dysfunctional time in society. That's my opinion. I mean, you know, you can't change how you feel about somebody. I love my children, love my wife, and things like that. But I'll say this, that it matters that someone knows how you feel. The old timer say stuff like this. There's a woman one time that come to the pastor and says, you know, my husband just never tells me that he loves me. She's crying, heartbroken. And so he says, well, let's have a counseling session. And he calls the family in. They sit down there. And he said, well, sir, he said, you know, your wife's in here the other day, man. She is heartbroken. She says that you never tell her that you love her. And he said, well, I told her when we got married 35 years ago, and if I change my mind, I'll let her know. <laughs> Sound like pretty good redneck theology, right? Badges don't work in life. You know? And you say, well, I'm just not natured that way. Well, let's get natured a different way. Because I'm going to tell you what steals the heart or captures the heart of your spouse, meeting that need. And if they're the kind of person, and we all are to some degree, 
every once in a while hearing, man, I appreciate you. I love you. Sure, sure, I'm thankful that God put us together. Those kinds of things, it means something to us, whether we show it or not. Now, I want to say this. Don't expect just to flip a switch one day and say, you know what I'm going to do today? Today's the day. I'm going to capture their heart. If you've not put in the front end work, you're not doing it that day. You may start the process, but you're not doing it that day. And I want to say this. There are five distinct things that Absalom did to capture the heart of the men of that city. And in doing so, he was able not just to capture one individual's heart. That's all we really are trying to do is capture the heart of one individual, our spouse. He captured the whole entire city's heart. So it's possible. It can be done. The question is tonight, will we see the areas we're deficient in and will we even put forth the effort? Now, let me just, a word of caution. We're going to close the service. Have altar of prayer. If you're not careful, especially if you're younger, You'll blow this week off like just any other week of church. And you'll miss out on the opportunity to do some things right now that will, is going to dictate your happiness 15, 20 years from now. And you'll get there and look back and say, man, I should, that conference at Dakota, I should have listened and shouldn't have blew that stuff off because we're going to preach the Bible. It's going to uncover some stuff. And don't act like it ain't there. Oh, no, it's there. And the best thing you can do in a meeting like this, and these six services, three of them's already gone. Right? I'm done right now. Three of them's gone. Is deal with the elephants in the room. Because if you don't deal with those elephants, they'll still be there in six weeks, six months, and six years, and they'll be there the day that you walk away from each other and decide this thing ain't worth having anymore. But if you get in line, and if you make your mind up tonight, I'm going to do whatever it takes to capture the heart of my spouse. If two people in the same family make that decision, they're going to be fine. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The, the call this evening to action is this right here. The majority of the message that I preached tonight was about giving. And if you're going to capture the heart of your spouse, you're going to have to be willing to give, 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 work, intentionally do things to get there. And the story of Absalom is this. He did not get their heart until he gave to them. Now, here's my question for you tonight in your marriage. Is it all about giving or is it all about taking? Somewhere in the middle there should be a 50-50 split. You, you get to take, but not until you've gave. So tonight, are you giving your spouse what they need? Are you putting forth the effort to steal their heart? And if you're not tonight, would this be the evening you say, you know what, it's time for things to change and it's starting with me. Yeah. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, the pianist is going to play softly. The altar will be open tonight. I'm going to turn the service over to Pastor McKittrick. I challenge you tonight, if God spoke to your heart about something, don't just Sit there with knowledge of truth. Make a move toward God and get things straightened out with Him because your spouse knows whenever you've made that move and then that opens the door for things to be repaired there that may be broken from days gone by. Pastor McKittrick. The altar is open. If God spoke to your heart this evening, we invite you to come. What a great challenge. What if we took it tonight and applied it to our heart and said, tonight, I am going to set out in this process. I'm going to make it a purpose in my life to capture the heart of my spouse. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to find out what makes her tick. I'm going to find out what makes him tick. I'm going to figure out uh, how they understand things. I'm going to try to find out what's important to them. I'm going to make that important to me. I'm going to give words of compliment. I'm just going to make up my mind, husbands, I'm going to win the wife, uh, win the heart of my wife. Wives, I'm going to win the heart, capture the heart of my husband. Whatever the need this evening, the altar is open. Why don't you take a few minutes and just make some commitments to the Lord?